Hello, everyone. Welcome to webinar number eight in the Highway Safety Manual training series. This series is sponsored by the Florida Department of Transportation. The webinar series is offering training on AASHTO's Highway Safety Manual. This manual is known by its acronym HSM. This particular webinar will present the material in HSM Chapter 19, which addresses ramp safety. I should note that Chapter 19 was not part of the HSM's 2010 release. Rather, Chapter 19 was published in 2014 as part of the 2014 supplement to the HSM. My name is Jim Bonison, and I welcome you to this webinar. I'm a senior principal at Kittleson Associates, and my office is in College Station, Texas. If you have any questions after the webinar, please send me an email at the address shown here in the middle of the slide, and I'll be happy to uh, get some answers to you as soon as possible. There are two learning objectives for this webinar. One is to inform you about the safety impacts of ramp design elements in traffic control features. A second objective is to demonstrate the use of the HSM to compute the average crash frequency of a ramp segment. Now there are three main points that I want to make during this webinar. My goal is to make these points as we, as we go through the presentation today. First, predictive models provide a scientific basis for reliably estimating the average crash frequency of a ramp. Second, many ramp design elements and traffic control features can have an effect on safety. And third, any given design element or traffic control feature may affect the frequency of some crash types or severities more than it does other types or severity categories. This webinar is the eighth of nine webinars the previously conducted webinars can be found on the Florida DOT's Office of Safety website. The next webinar will be conducted in the very near future. The content of today's webinar originates from Part C of the HSM. Now this part includes safety prediction methods for various roadway facility types. Today's webinar is focused on Chapter 19, which contains the predictive method for ramps. This slide identifies several websites that provide useful information to support and guide HSM-related safety evaluations. Most notable is the first website listed, the Florida DOT HSM website. This website provides links to most of the other resources that are listed here. The presentation today consists of six lessons. We're going to take them in the order listed here. In the first lesson, we will talk generally about using the HSM predictive method for ramp safety evaluation. Then in the second and third lessons, we'll talk about the safety performance functions, or SPFs, and the crash modification factors, or CMFs, that make up the predictive method. In the fourth lesson, I'll show you how the method is used to evaluate a ramp segment. In lesson five, I'll demonstrate the use of spreadsheet software to automate the ramp segment evaluation process. And finally, in lesson six, I'll wrap up the presentation and take some of your questions. So let's get started. Lesson one, it has three topics of discussion. They are the predictive model, the predictive method, and the segmentation process. A predictive model includes a safety performance function, multiple crash modification factors, and a local calibration factor. These model components are multiplied together to estimate the predicted average crash frequency for a particular site of interest. The HSM tells us that a predictive method consists of two things. One is a set of predictive models, 
which we've just discussed. And the second is the guidance for using these models. Now this guidance consists of an 18-step process that is used to evaluate the safety of a site, a group of sites, or an entire roadway facility. In the ramps chapter, a site is considered to be a ramp segment, a collector distributor road segment, or a crossroad ramp terminal. Now, in the interest of time today, we will focus our discussion on just ramp segments. The software that implements the method also follows the 18-step process. The first six steps consist of the data assembly activities that are completed by the analyst. Step seven calls for initiating the calculation process, <clears throat> which is automated in the software. In fact, the software automates step seven and all the remaining steps. Now, we've just discussed the steps of the predicted method in a previous webinar. So today, we're going to use our time to discuss the other ramp safety topics. The ramp predictive method works for all ramp configurations because it involves splitting the ramp into segments and separately evaluating each segment. The drawings in this slide show several common ramp configurations. The configurations shown include the diamond ramp, partial cloverleaf loop ramp, free flow loop ramp, button hook ramp, outer connection ramp, direct connection ramp, and the semi-direct connection ramp. A collector, a collector distributor road is also shown in the slide. Now, it's not a ramp configuration per se, but it is the type of site that's addressed by the method. So it is shown here uh, for completeness. So let's talk about the ramp segmentation process. It involves dividing a ramp facility into sites. One type of site is described as a ramp segment, which is a short length of ramp that has a constant cross section. A second type of site is a crossroad ramp terminal. Now the illustration in the upper right corner of this slide shows a plan view of an interchange and the length of freeway. The freeway is shown to support travel in the right to left travel direction. The roadbed for the other travel direction is not shown. There is one exit ramp and one entrance ramp shown. The illustration at the bottom of the slide shows the interchange after it has been divided into sites. There are three diagonal ramp segments. They are shown in the middle of the slide as rectangles. There are two loop ramp segments. They are shown near the bottom of the slide as semicircles. There is one crossroad ramp terminal, and it's shown as a square. And there is one crossroad segment that's shown as a large rectangle at the bottom of the slot. The location of each ramp segment is defined using a reference line. There is one reference line per ramp. The analyst needs to establish this reference line early on in the process of segmenting ramps. Now, in addition to location, this line is also used to determine the length of various ramp design features, such as curve length. The reference line is defined to coincide with the right edge of traveled way in the direction of travel. It is, defined, is identified by the words reference line in each of the two figures at the bottom of this slide. The reference line for entrance ramps starts at the intersection of the reference line and the near edge of traveled way on the crossroad. You can see this point of intersection in the figure in the lower left corner of the slide. The reference line for exit ramps it starts at the gore point. This point is defined as the point where the marked gore is two feet wide. 
This point is shown in the figure located in the bottom right corner of the slide. Now the start of the, of the ramp reference line, which is the start of the ramp, it's labeled ramp mile 0, 0.0. The location of each downstream ramp curve is specified as the distance from this starting point to the point where the curve begins. Okay, so we know where the ramp starts, so where does it end? Well, we will use the same two points that we just used to define the start, but we'll use them in reverse order. That is, the reference line for an entrance ramp ends at a core point where the ramp merges with the freeway. And the reference line for an exit ramp ends at the point where the line intersects with the near edge of the crossroad. Once the start and end points have been identified, the ramp of interest is further evaluated for homogeneity or consistency in its basic characteristics. If there is any change in the character of, a, of one of these characteristics, the ramp is subdivided into segments, such that within each subdivided segment, the characteristics are consistent. Now, the criteria that define what constitute a significant change in character, these, these criteria are provided in section 19.5 of chapter 19. The basic goal here is to divide the ramp into segments that are homogeneous or consistent in all characteristics that influence safety. Characteristics that, that are related to safety on a ramp include well, geometric, characteristics and traffic volume characteristics. Key geometric characteristics include the number of lanes, lane width, and shoulder width. The one segmentation criterion is based on a change in the number of through lanes. If a lane is being added, as shown in this slide, then one ramp segment ends and a new ramp segment begins as the point occurs at the taper point. The taper point is defined as the point where the edge line is, <coughs> is tapered, first introducing is the additional through lane or perhaps for dropping a through lane. Either way, the taper point is used to define the end of one segment and the start of the next. You can see in this figure that at the taper point, segment one ends and segment two begins. The, se the second segment ends at the crossroad. It does not end at the start of a turn bay because a turn bay is not considered to be an additional through lane. Any crashes in the turn bay will be assigned to the intersection and not the ramp segment. The next few slides illustrate the segmentation process for an exit ramp at a Florida interchange. The ramp of interest is the eastbound exit ramp at I-10 and Thomasville Road in Tallahassee. The first ramp segment starts at the point where the mark gore is two feet wide. Now, I located a yellow push pin on the reference line just across from this mark core point. This pin is shown in the lower left corner of the photograph. The pin marks the beginning of the ramp and the beginning of the ramp reference line. So now I scan along the reference line, noting the number of lanes, the lane width, and the shoulder width. I'm looking for changes. For the left shoulder width, I judged it to be effectively one half of the width of the chevron painted island separating the ramp from the from the through lanes on the freeway. <clears throat> the width of this island increases for the first 50 to 60 feet. And I and I could argue that one segment is should should end and the new segment start because of this change in the effective left shoulder width. 
but a 50 to 60 foot segment would be a very short segment. And I decided to avoid short segments like this, trying to provide a more optimal balance between the predictive accuracy that I might get from a short, modern short segment and the time that I would spend managing segment data. So I did not, I did not stop at, the, at, this, uh, at that 50, 60 foot point. I continued on. I scanned further along the segment, and I found that at ramp mile 0 0.15, the left shoulder width changed from 10 feet down to 5 feet. So I decided to end segment 1 at this point and put a yellow push pin to mark the spot. You can see this pin on the right side of the photograph. So now let's move along the ramp in the direction of travel. The yellow pin we just located in the last slide is now on the left side of this photograph. This pin marks the end of the first segment and the start of the second segment. Now again, I scan along the segment looking for changes. I find that the left shoulder width changes again, but in this case from 5 feet back up to 10 feet at ramp mile 0 0.23. So, I decided to end segment two at this point and put a yellow push pin to mark the spot. This pin is located on the right side of the photograph. Okay, so let's move further along the ramp. The yellow pin we just located in the last slide is now on the left side of this photograph. It marks the end of the second segment and the start of the third segment. I scan along the ramp looking for changes. Now, I don't find any more changes in width of the lane or width of the shoulders or in the, or in the basic number of three lanes. So the segment continues to the end of the ramp. This end point is defined as the point where the ramp reference line intersects the near edge of the crossroad travelway. This is the point we've already discussed. And so I put a yellow push pin at this point of intersection to mark the spot. This pin is located on the right side of the photograph it marks the end of the ramp segment. Note that there are only two through lanes in this third segment. All of the other lanes were added as part of a turn bay, so they're not used to determine the number of through lanes in the segment. Okay, so let's take a quick poll to see if everyone is connecting with the concepts that I've presented so far. Please indicate the one choice that correctly answers this question. Which of the following items is not a criterion for ramp segmentation? A, number of lanes, B, clear zone width, C, shoulder width, D, lane width. The correct answer is B clear zone width. The other three items listed are used to determine segment boundaries. Clear zone width is not used. We're now ready to start with lesson two. In this lesson we will get acquainted with the various safety performance functions in the ramp method. A safety performance function is used to predict the average crash frequency for a site that has base conditions. In general, a site with base conditions has typical geometric dimension. For ramps, the SPFs have many base conditions, such as 14-foot lanes and 8-foot eight right shoulders. An example SPF is shown in the middle of this slide. It includes the variables A, B, and D. These are regression coefficients that were obtained by fitting the SPF to crash data. The values for these coefficients are provided in the HSM. The SPF also includes a variable for the segment, segment ADT and a, and a variable for the segment's length. The regression coefficients A, B, and D they can have different values depending on the crash type and severity that's being predicted. This table 
shows a sample of coefficient values for rural exit ramps with one through lane. Additional coefficients are available in Chapter 19 for other combinations of area type, ramp type, and number of lanes. The figure in this slide shows the relationship between AADT and predicted crash frequency for a ramp segment that is 0.2 miles in length. The x-axis shows the ramp AADT. The y-axis shows the predicted frequency of fatal and injury single vehicle crashes. The solid trend lines correspond to urban ramps. The dashed trend lines correspond to rural ramps. The numbers that are near the trend lines indicate the number of through lanes on the ramp. The SPF for ramp segments predicts an increase in crash frequency as traffic volume increases. For a given volume, the model predicts fewer crashes when the area type is rural. The model also predicts fewer crashes for a two-lane ramp compared to a one-lane ramp. In other words, more lanes results in fewer crashes. This slide lists the base conditions that are associated with the, the ramp segment SPFs. For these SPFs that, that predict single vehicle crash frequency, the base conditions include no horizontal curve, 14 foot lane width, 8 foot right shoulder width, 4 foot left shoulder width, no barrier on the roadside, and no lane add or lane drop in the ramp segment. Now these base conditions also apply to SPFs that predict multiple vehicle crash frequency. However, the multiple vehicle SPFs also have one additional base condition, which is no ramp to ramp speed change lane present. So this is the first example application. It demonstrates the use of an SPF to compute the predicted crash frequency for a ramp segment. Specifically, we're going to use an SPF to estimate the predicted multiple vehicle fatal and injury crash frequency for a segment. The scenario is a one-lane ramp segment at a rural interchange on I-10 just east of Tallahassee. The data that we need are listed on the left side of the slide. We have an AADT of 4,400 vehicles per day and a segment length of 0.317 miles. All geometric elements have a dimension that matches the base conditions, and the local calibration factor is 1. The predictive model form is repeated at the top of this slide. We saw it first back in slide 9. For this example, all CMF values are equal to 1 because the corresponding geometric variables are at their base condition value. The calibration factor is also 1. So mathematically, the estimate from the predictive model is effectively equal to that from the SPF. The SPF coefficients A, B, and D were shown previously in slide 23. For this example, the values that we need are minus 6.692, 0.524, and 0.0699. When we insert these values into the SPF and can compute the predicted crash frequency as 0.0012 multiple vehicle fatal or injury crashes per year. So let's continue the example by computing the frequency of the other three combinations of crash type and severity. Specifically, let's compute the predicted multiple vehicle PDO crash frequency, single vehicle fatal and injury crash frequency, and single vehicle PDO crash frequency. We can then add up all these estimates to get an, an estimate of the predicted total crash frequency. Now recall that we previously computed 
0.0012 multiple vehicle fatal or injury crashes per year. So we use the SPF again for each of the other three crash type and severity categories that we identified in the question. As before, the SPF coefficients A, B, and D are taken from, from the table that was shown in slide 23. For the multiple vehicle PDO crash frequency, we compute 0.016 crashes per year. This result is shown in the second box from the top of the slide. Continuing, we compute 0.15 to single vehicle fatal or injury crashes per year and 0.155 single vehicle PDO crashes per year. We can add these four values together to obtain the predicted total crash frequency of 0.324 crashes per year. As this result roughly equates to about one crash every three years. Okay, so let's take another poll to see if everyone is connecting with the concepts presented thus far. Uh, please indicate the one choice that correctly answers the following question. If a through lane is added to a ramp, that is, the ramp had one lane and the second lane was added, and nothing else changes, which of the following responses best describes the effect of this change on the predicted crash frequency? A, crash frequency will decrease. B, crash frequency will increase. And C, crash frequency will not change. The correct answer is A, crash frequency will decrease. You may recall that we discussed that the effect of one versus two ramp lanes using the figure in slide 24. The addition of a lane spreads out the cars and reduces crash frequency. Okay, we are now ready to start with lesson three. In this lesson, we will get acquainted with the various crash modification factors in the ramp method. There are eight CMFs available for ramp segments. Most of them are functions of geometric variables like lane width, shoulder width, or curve radius. They use the same base conditions as the SPFs. The CMFs can be used to adjust the estimate from the SPF to account for any non-base conditions that may be uh, present on the segment of interest. The CMFs were calibrated to work in combination with each other such that they are unlikely to overestimate the safety influence of any specific geometric element. This slide lists the eight CMFs available in the ramp method. For example, there is a horizontal curve CMF and a lane width CMF. In fact, each bullet represents one CMF. In the next few slides, we will look closely at a few of these CMFs. However, we will not be able to look at all of them in the time that we have available to us today. This slide illustrates the lane width CMF. The equation for this CMF is shown at the top of the slide used to compute CMF value for fatal and injury crashes. Now I should note that no CMF is provided for PDO crashes because the data that was examined by the researchers did not show a definitive trend between lane width and PDO crash frequency. The variable uh, W subscript L represents the average lane width. The base condition lane width is 14 feet. The relationship between the CMF value and lane width is shown in the figure. The x-axis represents lane width ranging from 11 to 18 feet. The y-axis represents the CMF value. The brown and red lines in the figure show how to determine the lane width CMF value for, for two different widths. For the base condition, which is a 14-foot width, we locate 14 on the x-axis go up the brown vertical line to the CMF trend line, and then follow the horizontal line over to the y-axis 
and there we find a CMF value of 1.0. So now let's consider a ramp segment that has a 15 foot lane width. Locate 15 on the x axis, go up the red vertical line to the CMF trend line, and then follow the horizontal line over to the y axis. Now there we find a CMF value of 0.955. Now the value of 0.955 tells us that since the segment's lane width is wider than base conditions, the segment is expected to experience 4.5% fewer crashes than a segment with base conditions. The extra width is reducing crash frequency. This slide illustrates the right shoulder width CMF. Two equations are shown at the top of the slide for, for computing the CMF value. The first equation is used to compute the CMF for fatal and injury crashes. The second equation is used to compute the CMF for PDO crashes. The variable W subscript RS is, represents the uh, average paved right shoulder width. The base right shoulder width is 8 feet. The relationship between the CMF value and the right shoulder width is shown in the table. The values shown indicate that the CMF value increases as the shoulder width is reduced. Now this slide illustrates the left shoulder width CMF. Two equations, again, are shown at the top of the slide for computing the CMF value. The first equation is used to compute the CMF for fatal and injury crashes. The second equation is used to compute the CMF for PDO crashes. The variable W subscript LS represents the average paved left shoulder width, and the base condition left shoulder width is 4 feet. The relationship between the CMF value and left shoulder width is shown in the table. The values shown indicate that the CMF value increases as the shoulder width is reduced. This slide begins our second example application. It, it demonstrates the calculation of CMF values using the equations that we've just discussed. Specifically, we're going to compute CMF values for the inside shoulder width and the outside shoulder width. The scenario is a ramp segment at a rural interchange at I-10 just east of Tallahassee. In fact, it is the same ramp segment that we used in the first example. The data that we need are listed on the left side of the slide. We have a left shoulder width of 2 feet and a right shoulder width of 4 feet. Okay, so let's first compute the left shoulder width CMFs. We saw the two equations for the CMF back on slide 36. They are repeated in the top half of this slide. We substitute the left shoulder width of 2 feet in each equation, and we compute a value of 1.114 for the CMF that's applicable to multiple vehicle fatal and injury crashes. We also compute a value of 1.053 for multiple vehicle PDO crashes. Now you may recall from slide 36 that the CMF equation for fatal and injury crashes is equally applicable to both multiple vehicle and single vehicle crashes. This relationship is shown in the third box from the top of the slide, where, where in this box I show the CMF value for the single vehicle fatal and injury crashes as being equal to the value of 1.114, which we previously computed. Now, for similar reasons, the CMF value for single vehicle PDO crashes is equal to 1.053, and that's shown in the box at the bottom of the slide. Okay, now let's compute the right shoulder width CMFs. We saw the two equations for this CMF back on slide 35. Again, they're repeated in the top half of this slide. We substitute the right shoulder width of 4 feet in each equation and compute a value of 1.241 for 
for the CMAP that's applicable to multiple vehicle fatal and injury crashes. We also compute a value of 1.109 for multiple vehicle PDO crashes. And we recall from slide 35 that the CMAP equation for fatal and injury crashes is equally applicable to both multiple vehicle and single vehicle crashes. The same is true for PDO crashes. And so you can see the resulting CMF values for single vehicle crashes in the last two boxes at the bottom of the slide. Okay, let's take another poll just to see if everyone is connecting with these concepts. Please indicate whether the following statement is true or false. Based on the HSM ramp method, the predicted crash frequency will decrease if the average left shoulder width for a ramp segment is reduced. And there, of course, there are no other changes. And, and by no other changes, I mean everything, all their dimensions stay the same. The correct answer is false. The predicted crash frequency will increase if the left shoulder width is reduced. Okay, so we're now ready to start with lesson four. On past lessons, we learned about SPFs and about CMFs. In this lesson, we're going to put everything together. <clears throat> Specifically, we're going to use the SPFs and the CMFs in a set of predictive models. Now, we're going to use these models to evaluate one specific ramp site. I have prepared uh, an example application just for, for this purpose. This is the third example application. It demonstrates the use of a set of predictive models to compute the predicted crash frequency for a ramp segment. The scenario is a ramp segment at a rural interchange on I-10, just east of Tallahassee. In fact, it is the same segment we've been using in the first two examples. The questions we're going to ask is, what is the multiple vehicle fatal and injury predicted crash frequency for the ramp segment? The data that we need are listed on the left side of the slide. We have a left shoulder width of 2 feet and a right shoulder width of 4 feet. And we should recall also that the local calibration factor equals 1.0. Okay, so to answer the question at hand, we need to apply the predictive model. The model that we're going to use is shown here in the box in the middle of the slide. In example 8A, we computed the value of the SPF for multiple vehicle fatal and injury crashes. It was 0 0.0012 multiple vehicle fatal and injury crashes per year. In example 8B, we computed the value of the CMF for a two-foot left shoulder width. For a multiple vehicle fatal and injury crash frequency, this CMF was determined to have a value of 1.114. Also in example 8B, we computed the value of the CMF for a four-foot right shoulder width. For a multiple vehicle fatal and injury crash frequency, this CMF was determined to have a value of 1.241. Okay, so now we have all the necessary values and we can compute the predicted crash frequency using the predictive model. Substituting the values in the equation, we compute the multiple vehicle and fatal injury crash frequency as 0 0.0016 crashes per year. Okay, so using the same approach as we did in the previous slide, we can now compute the answers to the two questions posed in this slide. The first question is, what is the predicted multiple vehicle PDO crash frequency the single vehicle fatal and injury crash frequency, and the single vehicle PDO crash frequency. The second question is, what is the predicted total crash frequency for the segment? The answer to the first question is obtained by, by application of the predictive model for each combination of crash type and severity. The calculation mechanics are the same as used for the multiple vehicle fatal and injury crash calculation that we just completed. 
So in the interest of time, I'm not going to show the rest of the calculations here. You should recall that the SPF values we need were computed in example 8A. The values that we computed are, in fact, shown here in column 3 of the table. Similarly, the CMF values that we need for the left shoulder width and the right shoulder width, they were computed in example 8B. These, and, and these CMF values are listed in columns 4 and 5 of the table. The answers to the first question are shown in the last column in rows 2, 3, and 4. They're outlined using a, a red box. We compute, using the predictive model, 0.019 multiple vehicle PVO crashes per year, 0 0.210 single vehicle fatal and injury crashes per year, and 0 0.180 single vehicle PVO crashes per year. The answer to the second question, that is, what is the total predicted crash frequency, that value is shown in the last row of the last column. Total predicted crash frequency, it's the sum of the four values above, and it equals 0 0.411 crashes per year. Okay, so we're now ready to start with lesson five. In this lesson, we will get acquainted with the Enhanced Interchange Safety Evaluation Tool. Its acronym is spelled I-S-A-T-E, and it's often pronounced as I-S-A-T-E. It is a software tool that automates the RAMP predictive method. Now, if you have a copy of the I-S-A-T-E software and your computer is in front of you, now is a good time to open your copy and follow along with me. ISATI consists of 11 worksheets. One of these worksheets is the welcome worksheet. It is the first worksheet that you see when ISAT is open. You can see the top portion of this worksheet in the slide here. The color-coded tabs at the bottom of the spreadsheet are used to access the other 10 worksheets. These tabs are highlighted using a red rectangle at the bottom of the slide. Now in the interest of time, we're going to focus our discussion today on just three of the 11 worksheets. These are the most commonly used worksheets when evaluating a ramp. The three worksheets that we will need are the main worksheet, the input ramp segments worksheet, and the output summary worksheet. Their use consists of the four steps that are listed at the bottom of the slide. The first step consists of inputting basic input data in the main worksheet. The second step consists of entering site data in the input ramps segments worksheet. The third step consists of returning back to the main worksheet and starting the calculation. The fourth step consists of re reviewing the results in the output summary worksheet. This slide shows a portion of the main worksheet. The cells in this sheet, and, and in fact in all other sheets, are color-coded. Many of the cells in the worksheets are white or gray, and these cells uh, often contain descriptions, labels, or heading information. Some cells are blue, and these cells are used to input the data that describe the sites being analyzed. Many of the white or gray cells have a red triangle in the upper right-hand corner. When the mouse cursor is placed over a red triangle, a message box will appear. And, uh, the message will contain information that will clarify requirements for measuring or entering input data. And in fact, one of these message boxes is shown in the middle of this slide. This slide shows a portion of the input ramp segments worksheet. Each segment is allocated two columns if the EB adjustment is used. Now, that's the case here, and so in fact two columns are provided for each of the two segments that are shown. Now if the EB adjustment is not used, then only one column 
is used for each segment. Several functions are provided in this worksheet to manage the data that are entered. These functions are activated by clicking on one of the two buttons in the upper left portion of the worksheet. The buttons I'm referring to are highlighted in the slide using a blue oval. One button is used to clear all the input data from the worksheet. This action is performed by clicking the clear button. The second button is used to check input values. This action is performed by clicking the check input values button. Advisory messages will appear after this button is clicked if there are any issues with the input data. Advisory messages are updated every time the check input values button is clicked. This button should be used every time data is entered. It should be reused until all issues are addressed and no advisory messages appear. Okay, so let's, uh, let's demonstrate the use of the ICE head E to evaluate a ramp segment. The exit ramp on US 90 at I-10 is used for this demonstration. It's the same ramp segment that we used in the previous example. As a first step in our evaluation, we'll go to the main worksheet to identify the study years and to indicate whether crash data are being used in the evaluation. For this demonstration, the analysis year is 2017, and no crash data are being used. You can see the value 2017 entered in the two blue cells in the, in the upper right corner of the slide. Now, we are not using crash data for our ramp segment evaluation, so we indicate this preference using the drop-down list in the middle of the slide. The red dimension line is overlaid on the aerial photo to show the location of the subject ramp segment. It's a portion of the ramp. It is not all of the ramp. There's a short curve with a very large radius just before the start of the segment. This curve may slow vehicles a little after they exit the highway and before they enter the segment. At the other end of the ramp, where it connects to I-10, the ramp ends with a speed change lane, thus, thus there, are, there is no signal or sign control at the end of the ramp. All other relevant input data are listed at the left side of this slide. They include one lane, a length of 0.317 miles, a freeway speed limit of 70 miles per hour, curve radius of 2,530 feet, a curve length of 0.085 miles, and the start of the curve is at 0.021 miles from the start of the ramp. The second step in the evaluation process requires us to use the input ramp segments worksheet. This is the worksheet where we enter the input data. These data were listed in the previous slide and they are shown here in this slide along the right side in the, in the column of blue cells. As it, they're shown in the order that they're entered into the ISATI worksheet. The horizontal curve that I mentioned is not located on our segment but it's upstream of the segment and it may influence vehicle speed on our segment and in fact on any downstream segment. As a result, it's necessary to enter the curve data here so the software can develop a speed profile and then use this profile to accurately assess the effect of speed on the safety of our segment. Some additional input data describing the geometry and traffic volume on the, on the ramp are shown in this slide. Uh, they include lane width of 14 feet, a right shoulder width of 4 feet, left shoulder width of 2 feet, no lane add or drop, no roadside barrier, no point of merge or diverge with a second ramp, and an AD, AADT of 4,400 vehicles per day. 
The input data listed in the previous slide are shown here along the right side of this slide, you know, just in the way that they were entered into the ISAT -E tool. When all of the data are entered, the analyst would then click on the check input values to confirm that they are entered correctly and consistently. As a third step in the process, the analyst returns to the main worksheet to start the calculation process. The calculations are started by clicking on the Perform Calculations button. When the calculations are completed, we can perform the fourth and final steps of the evaluation process by reviewing the results in the Output Summary Worksheet. Now, since we have evaluated only one fairly simple segment, I'm going to skip over our review of the Output Summary Worksheet. Instead, I'm going to show you the Output Ramp Segments Worksheet. Now, this worksheet provides much more detailed information and intermediate results from the analysis. The predicted crash frequencies for each severity category are shown in row 279 of this worksheet. These results can be compared with those from example 8C, which were shown to you previously in slide 45. The total fatal and injury crash frequency is shown in this slide here to be 0.212 fatal and injury crashes per year. This value is identical to that that was shown back in slide 45. Similarly, the total PDO crash frequency is shown to be 0 0.199 PDO crashes per year, which is also matching the results from example 8C. The predicted total crash frequency is 0 0.411 crashes per year, uh, again, a match to the example 8C, in 8C. Uh, and, and the 0 0.411 could also be thought of saying roughly one crash every two and a half years. All right, let's take a, another poll just to see if everyone is connecting with the, the concepts presented thus far. We know that the analyst uses several of the available worksheets in ISETI to evaluate a RAM. So which of the following worksheets is not used in the typical sequence for RAM segment analysis? A, the main worksheet. B, the input RAM terminals worksheet. C, the input ramp segment worksheet, D, the main worksheet, and E, the output summary worksheet. The correct answer is B, input ramp terminals worksheet. The input ramp terminals worksheet is not used for ramp segment analysis. It's used for evaluating ramp crossroad ramp terminals. Okay, so we're now ready to start the last lesson. I plan to cover the limitations of the predictive method and, and to make a few closing comments. The ramp methodology in Chapter 19, it, it, it addresses many different design conditions, but it does not address all design conditions. The ones that it does not address are listed here on this slide. Specifically, the method does not address ramps with two or more lanes in rural areas or those with three or more lanes in urban areas. It does not address ramps providing two-way travel or those with ramp meters. The method does not address ramps with HOV bypass lanes or frontage roads. It does not address the speed change lane that is sometimes used when one ramp merges with the crossroad. As I, as I noted back on one of the very first few slides, there are three main points that I wanted to make during this webinar. I'm going to repeat them here. First, Predictive models provide a scientific basis for reliably estimating the average crash frequency of a ramp. Second, many ramp design elements and traffic control features can have an effect on safety. 
And third, any given design element or traffic control feature may affect the frequency of some crash types or severities more than it does other types or severities. I hope you can see the justification for these points based on what we've discussed today. Okay, well, thanks for attending this webinar. We appreciate your taking time to be with us today. We'll now go live to answer some of your questions in the remaining time.